Hello and good morning. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you're healthy and well at home. Uh, this is a webinar series, a first of 12 that Orange is putting on, on the new normal. It's our understanding of how COVID-19 is impacting uh, spheres of life, including enterprise. I'll be joined today by Claudia Van Moons, a venture advisor to NEA, and my colleague Will Barkas will be fielding questions from the audience. So please feel free to enter some on the right here. Uh, you should see a, a question window. Okay, let's jump into it. So the webinar series we'll be covering uh, this summer is called Business Resilience in All Times. It's thought leadership to support uh, our team and our customers through this crisis. Uh, we'll be looking through the lens of our San Francisco office, which does innovation and engagement, and through our business partner organization. Uh, our San Francisco office has been in the Bay Area for more than 20 years. We're a team of 45 engineers, analysts, and product managers. Uh, we have 17 current focus areas. This evolves as the, the market changes, and we look at the future trajectory of both Orange and our large customers. Uh, Orange is a very large telecommunications company serving 264 million customers across 28 geographies. So uh, here's who's on the line today, uh, Claudia Van Moons, who we'll have a fireside chat with at the end of the presentation, and myself, I'm a senior product manager in our strategy organization. So why are we here today? Well, many reasons, uh, but this recent pandemic has had a significant and profound influence on our global economy. Um, I found this uh, data to be very interesting, pulled from the United States Department of Employment and Training Administration. We've really seen an unparalleled surge in unemployment claims in recent weeks. So to put this in perspective, we have the 1970s energy crisis, or the 2008 financial crisis, uh, but obviously neither compare adequately to what we're going through now on a macroeconomic standpoint. Additionally, we've seen US public debt increase 2 trillion in the last two months. And it, it's easy to kind of get lost in these very large numbers, but that's about a 13% increase over previous. Um, and if you think about it in terms of what currency is in circulation, we have about 1.91 a trillion U.S. dollar denominated bills in circulation globally. Uh, the Federal Reserve did a study in 1996 and estimated that about 60% of this is abroad. It's probably higher than that today, to be honest. Um, and why am I telling you this? Well, as an enterprise, I think we'll see, if we see foreign holdings of U.S. dollar denominated currency go down in the coming years, we will likely see massive inflation. Uh, and what that means from a corporate management perspective is you'll probably be seeing more companies cite their earnings in constant currency. We've already seen it in the quarterly filings for uh, the first and second quarter for the top companies in the United States. And as there is an anticipated increase in the rate of inflation, you'll see more uh, people pegging their own uh, value creation to the prior currency value. So digital transformation, both McKinsey and Harvard have studies showing that there are really two forms of digital transformation. Those that are an evolution of the existing business. And you can think about how you would take a call center and add a chat bot to continue doing your existing business in a new and more efficient way. And then you have the more difficult, uh, the more adjacent or the more new uh, business in the form of digital transformation and how you can think of that as an automotive manufacturer going from making and distributing and selling high-end cars or just good cars uh, to one that has to succeed or thrive or compete in a mobility as a service model where there's an intermediary who's transporting people and car ownership is on the decline. What we've seen across the board is that this crisis is accelerating digital transformation. Many companies, most if not all incumbent or legacy organizations are in some process of digital transformation. The CEO of Accenture is saying that her customers, CEOs at top companies, were being held back by hierarchy. They were held back by culture. 
And then this absolute shift as a result of COVID-19 has caused them to have to migrate to remote work to empower more digitally enabled processes, and they don't want to go back. Microsoft CEO Tatia Nadella said, we've seen two years of digital transformation in two months uh, from remote work and learning, sales and customer support to critical cloud infrastructure and security. Uh, Andy Yang, former vice, uh, former presidential candidate for the United States, also uh, a proponent of dramatic transformational change of technology says, we're just seeing an accelerated rate that we had already expected. So years of progress in just 10 weeks. The easiest lens through which to look at this is remote work. Uh, there was a really cool study done by Adam Ozemek, the chief economist at Upwork. He surveyed uh, audiences of hiring managers and VPs at U.S. public companies uh, in November 2019 to April. Uh, sorry, he surveyed them in November 2019 and found that 46 percent had no remote workers, only 2.3 percent. So very paltry. Some had fully remote teams and 13.2% had a share of their team remote. Given the recent events, he went back and surveyed them again. He found that the percentage of companies that had no remote workers had gone to 6%, so 94% with some remote teams. Uh, the percentage that have gone fully remote has increased to 20%, so again, an 8.7x increase. Uh, the share of employees remote for companies has gone from 13.2% to 56 uh, to 74%, so a four and a half X increase. So how, how sticky is this transformation? Well, post COVID 21.8% of it, hiring managers anticipate they'll be fully remote in five years. So this is up 65% uh, from just 13.2%. Uh, so again, a, a pretty significant and profound change for the way we do work. Some companies have indicated they'll never go back. Mark Zuckerberg on a town hall with his employees said some will work from home permanently. Uh, Twitter uh, said through their HR teams that opening offices will be our decision. If and when our employees come back, it will be theirs. Uh, Shopify, the CEO himself, uh, Toby Lutka, tweeted, as of today, Shopify is a digital by default company. Most will permanently work remotely. Office centricity is over. Uh, and Square, also the same management team as at least the highest levels as Twitter, said that they'll be moving completely remote and that they'll be able to work from anywhere permanently. If you look at just the top five companies by market cap and the technology leadership that many uh, companies follow from a trend setting perspective, three of five have said we're not returning to work till at least January 2021. The five-year outlook also indicates a, a more permanent shift. So before COVID, uh, from the same Adam Ozemek uh, Upwork study, which is avail available online and can be shared after the presentation, 30% uh, anticipated to go full-time remote within five years. Uh, after that, it's 60%. So why not return? Well, for a long time, we've known the economic and societal benefits of remote work. 95% of employees when polled would on average work 2.4 days per week from home if given the opportunity. 65% of part-time workers are those that are some engaged sometimes and not always in, in the labor force indicated they would work more remote hours if given the opportunity. So they would work more hours if they could work remote. The Center for Economic and Business Research indicates that it could add 2.36 trillion in gross value added to the U.S. economy. This is through productivity improvements, additional employment, uh, increased economic participation and activity. And this is this was study was commissioned by Citrix. Uh, and remote workers are happier. 71% of remote employees say they are happy at their job, whereas just 55% of on-site workers say they are happy at their job. So about a 22% increase in, in, in happiness uh, indication by employees. Uh, Bill McDermott, when interviewed recently on CNBC, said talented people are going to expect companies to allow them to work from home and anywhere, not just their personal wellness, but for productivity reasons. So this is a big idea for the modern economy. Of course, Bill McDermott is the CEO of ServiceNow, 
Uh, so we have to understand that he, he's a potential, his company is a potential beneficiary from the work from home movement. Additionally, outside of just work from home, but obviously overlapping, public clouds received a significant boost, uh, could receive a significant boost from COVID-19. Uh, their quarterly uh, year over year revenue gains are, are substantial uh, in line with previous uh, gains. Um, but it's going to accelerate this trend of removing to remote infrastructure. I, I like this quote that as the pandemic moves in, on-premise moves out. Or to put it in a different way, any legacy software that required employees to be on campus has just been trashed. Uh, this is by the CEO of Particle Labs, a company I admire and we've worked with before uh, to build an integrated cellular development kit. And he was speaking at his annual uh, developer event, which they held remote, obviously. Additionally, business applications are surging. Uh, App Annie, the best uh, indicator for app downloads, indicate, uh, has came out with a report that there was a plus 90% year-over-year gain in enterprise apps. If you look at the top three business apps on their system, it's all video conferencing. And the fourth is Indeed Job Search, because frankly, there are a lot of people on the market looking for employment opportunities. Video conferencing and collaboration, as mentioned, in particular, are surging. Uh, Cisco WebEx reported on March 2nd that they had seen 2,200% growth in the WebEx backbone connected China-based WebEx users to the global workforce. Uh, they haven't updated a, a global metric yet since then. I've been looking for it. I'm, I'm very keen to understand because I've been taking more WebEx meetings than I ever have in my life. Um, Zoom, despite controversy, is still posting significant user adoption and growth. As of April 22nd, they boasted more than 300 million daily active users, up from 200 million just a month prior. Uh, Microsoft Teams now has 75 million daily active users, uh, which spiked to more than 200 in a, in, in a single day in April. Uh, additionally, what's more interesting to me is that they've seen a significant growth in accounts enterprise accounts on Microsoft Teams. So in December 2018, the largest account single customer was 170,000 subs. Uh, today, that's 500,000 with Accenture alone. And they have more than 20 customers over the 100,000 mark. Unfortunately, for some portions of the labor economy, this acceleration will likely cause an acceleration of jobless, uh, an acceleration of job replacement. Uh, a National Bureau of Economic Research study found that uh, job losses concentrated in economic downturns with 88% of job loss posted within 12 months of a dated recession. Uh, they also found that recoveries are often jobless, accompanied by much lower or much slower recoveries in aggregate employment. I think I've seen this personally. I have a friend who owns uh, several burger restaurants in the Bay Area. Uh, she closed down for good reason to protect the health and wellness of her employees until they could come up with a good strategy to reopen, which they have since. Uh, but Creator, this robot burger machine, at the same time announced extended dining hours and additional service capabilities. So it, it's a natural uh, adjacency that ro robots will <laughs> accelerate their participation in our society uh, in this in this moment. Uh, we already expected the market for collaborative robotics to increase dramatically. This is a Barclays uh, equity research finding on the right. Uh, it's just a trend I think we'll see accelerated by the pandemic. E-commerce additionally is booming. Uh, on their Q1 earnings call, which uh, Shopify saw 47% year over year uh, quarterly gains, they found that uh, the number of stores created in three days or less increased by 85% between March 14th and April 24th relative to the six weeks leading up. Uh, they believe, the CEO believes, that the growth of omni-channel uh, omni commerce is likely to persist. Uh, this post-COVID world is what they're building for, and it's really just accelerating its, the shift online. Uh, equivalently, uh, Square, which helps local merchants get online, saw gross profit of 539 million in Q1, up 36% year over year, or 40% if you exclude uh, caviar, which is not done as well. And Jack Dorsey was quoted saying that the transition or transformation to online has been break fast. 
Amazon, as we all anticipated, uh, significant sales gains and probably more from Q2 when we see those published. Uh, sales increased 26% to $75 billion in the first quarter. Additionally, customer care, is, although already fragmented and moving to digital platforms, is likely to be done from a house near you right now. Uh, the number one customer contact method from an NTT study is email. Uh, most enterprises now support eight customer channels with it forecasted to go higher. Uh, but two thirds of those companies have no cross channel customer management strategy. Uh, so I think we all know this, but when we engage with the brand, we may do so through their mobile app or following them on Twitter or LinkedIn, or connecting on Facebook, comparing online, reading reviews, reading the blog. There are many ways in which we engage with brands. We think that they're one organization, that they're one relationship to the consumer, but often these are siloed and not integrated. Uh, um, it's my uh, belief that this recent pandemic will accelerate the integration and the additional digital transformation of customer service. Uh, there is some downside. One Harvard Business Review study found a massive uptick in both customers and representatives saying, I can't understand you as people were dialing in from uh, their home office. Additionally, uh, McKinsey found that digital delivery has become a necessity for customers who are confined at home, even those who were digitally resilient or would prefer to go to an in-person uh, store to, to make their uh, purchases or changes. One trend that's undeniable is the force majeure for strategic staff reductions and divestments, it hasn't hit, it's hit, hit every industry, including technology. Uh, these are some of the technology companies that we follow in the Bay Area that, that have announced uh, some terminations. I want to call your attention to the last one, though. Uh, Automatic Labs, which was acquired by Sirius XM, was completely shut down, uh, quote, as the COVID pandemic has adversely impacted our business. Uh, Automatic is an OBD2 port connected device for aftermar aftermarket connected device for cars. So you plug it into your existing car and it tells you where you are, how, how fast you're driving. Uh, you can do insurance and diagnostics against it. And really, uh, I'm not able to understand how the market for aftermarket connected car appliances would be adversely impacted. Uh, so you know, conclude your, your own uh, decision, but I... I, I believe this to be more of a uh, using the pandemic to close off a costly line of business after an acquisition. And I think we'll see more of that. Uh, it's a very tolerable legal excuse uh, to, to reduce staff uh, during moments like this. For telecom operators and content delivery networks, it's been a significant stress test. So we've had a 700% increase in enterprise users connecting remotely. We already see video conferencing up 20 to 100% on our network. Uh, Google alone had uh, 25 times the number of users on Google Meet, uh, their video conferencing platform from January to April. Uh, on March 24th, they announced that they're reducing the quality of video, uh, videos worldwide on YouTube to ease traffic. They didn't announce uh, use the statistics, but uh, it's believed to have gone high. Uh, Verizon uh, VPN usage per, uh, surged 81%. Um, the additional interest in VPNs is, is renewing the zero trust uh, conversation where we're moving to boundaryless and firewall-less security environments. Uh, and the gaming up on, is up on their platform 82% with peak up 257%. Uh, interesting quote from the CEO of Verizon that it has not changed, uh, COVID-19 has not changed how we think about doing 5G. It's only reinforced that it's a great solution. And if you think about congestion in uh, cable networks, as many of us are connected to, uh, which is determined by the number of users in your locality, moving some of that traffic to a, a fixed 5G uh, might make a lot of sense. As a ray of hope, uh, those companies who were transformed were far more resilient and prepared for COVID-19, those who had undergone a significant digital transformation. I really enjoyed this uh, presentation by Mike McNamara at the 2017 National Retail Federation. Uh, he articulated three goals for transforming Target. 
ruthless prioritization. At the time that he took the helm in 2015, they had 800 concurrent IT projects internally. Uh, and when asked what he needed to do from the board, he said less money and fewer people. Uh, having too much money and too many people uh, means you do stuff that doesn't matter. And then I love this. He said you get lost in a kind of fog of inconsequence. Uh, so he was really able to focus the organization. He built an in-house engineering team uh, with Silicon Valley talent and culture. Uh, and they adopted agile methodologies, not just uh, from a technology perspective, but across the footprint of Target. So fast forward to today, what does that mean for them entering this pandemic? Well, first quarter online sales grew 141%, while in-store sales only grew 10.8%. So they still saw you know, growth as people needed to continue shopping in this, uh, this environment, but it was far more substantial growth on their online platforms. Additionally, same-day delivery orders grew 278%. A little informal advertisement for our friends at Target. They have this uh, very clean app uh, where you can order from the phone and then pick up in the parking lot at the Target. So just to finish, um, you know, they, there's this uh, meme floating around the internet. It's attributed to a woman named Susan Wolk, originally on Twitter. And the saying goes, who led the digital transformation of your company? Was it your CEO, your CTO, or COVID-19? So, and I think my personal opinion is that we're on a existing transformation. For many companies, it would have happened in the five to 10 year window, and it's being pushed to the two to five week window as companies are forced to, to stay in business and empower their teams to work remote. So, um, with that, I'd like to transition to the next session, which will be a fireside Q&A with Claudia van Moons. Uh, Claudia and I first met in uh, Dublin, Ireland, when I was a global mentor for the IBM Smart Camp uh, Entrepreneurship Program. Uh, she has a long and storied career, starting as an engineer at IBM Research and Development and moving her way into a VP of Strategy and the head and founding partner of IBM Venture Group. She is now serving as a advisor to NEA, a large uh, Bay Area based venture capital firm, and she's a lecturer at Stanford and, and is pursuing uh, equal rights with an uh, independent organization. She's a founding member of called parity.org, which pursues uh, equal uh, gender balance in uh, public companies who sign a pledge. So uh, thank you so much, Claudia, for joining us today. Um, I'd love to get this conversation uh, kicked off. I hope you enjoyed the uh, presentation. But so one of the things that I read in your recent uh, re board document was that uh, we have to remember that this is a humanitarian crisis first. Uh, for me, my boss has always asked me how I'm doing as we get on the phone. And it's meant a lot to me, to be honest. So uh, how have you seen admirable leaders incorporating the consequences of this pandemic into their decision making? Oh, well, thank you, Jameson. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, we go back a long way, as you guys heard. Um, you know, I think your boss is already a, a good example of leading uh, leaders that really are um, um, stepping up in a time like this. I think is really about, um, you know, leading with your heart more than ever in the history. I think as a public company board member and also uh, working with so many young companies, this is really the moment where you see leaders stepping up in their ability to care about the people more than the profit and the revenue aspect. Um, you know, I, I in the beginning of the crisis, I used to comment that suddenly, you know, you know, they're all walking around with a bleeding heart because they're so worried about the people, worry about the safety, worry about, of course, we all remember when the debt rate was rising, you know, in a, in a way that it scared all of us to retreat back into our home without ever venture outside our doors. And the leader, of course, were all very frantic about, you know, what that may impact inside their own, you know, uh, employee base as well as their customer base. So I saw that as, I will say, 
historical moment of my life where you actually got to know the leader of the humanity aspect of who they are more so than their intellect their experience all the other attributes that we have come to admire in a leader play a second you know cheer to how they were responding to the crisis and jemison asking how you are is a very very important aspect of leading during the crisis um the other is really the agility i think you mentioned that word several times there were so much of the uh the the uncertainty we didn't know what is going to be happening next we do not know what is the right approach there were certainly no references from the past there were no book written about um the crisis that we were going through so a lot of us were really in this incredible uh, moment where the fear dominated the decision making so a good leader really was able to for the first time, I mean, I used to comment, Jim, as you know, sitting on the public company and the venture back company, or even before that, being part of a very large corporation, but leading the corporate venture, which puts me right in the middle of the venture back startup community. I used to comment the difference between large company and small companies, how agile the decision making process mm -hmm. was right and i have to say i'm very impressed across the board uh how fast the decision making process was across the board i guess you know is is uh is in my opinion natural for a large corporation to be slow because we have so much more in state and we have so much more complex a uh, governance structure but I will say the, the agile agility to absorb information, quickly make decision or quickly adopt the information to make a adaptation of whatever the policies that you have put forward a day ago, two days ago, or sometimes even hours ago, was really the leadership traits that we saw emerge very quickly during this crisis. Mm -hmm. And the other is the com is really the transparency, because nobody knows what is the absolute facts, but being able to communicate how you're doing things and why you're doing things, that communication really took you know, a great leadership to execute across the board. So we may not know what the reality looked like, but we knew where the decision came from, from our leaders. And that was some of the very few sources of comfort that we were faced with in, um, in the time that we have gone through and still going through right now. Interesting. So putting, uh, and I should also mention that you're a, a board member to BNP Paribas, who we, we know the company well. They're, they're originally a French-based company, as well as Best Buy and some other organizations. So your incredibly unique perspective stemming the innovation side, the corporate governance side. But, but putting the investor hat on for just a moment, how do you see this and shifting your kind of investment priorities or uh, opportunity priorities uh, given this massive transition to work from home, uh, given the entrepreneur response to COVID, uh, what, what uh, are there promising areas of uh, investment and, and work from the entrepreneur community? You know, the uh, from a startup, and as you know, Jamison, you know, NEA is a 450 company portfolio uh, uh, investment firm. Uh, you will you will look at the companies that has an opportunity to really advance their position in the marketplace right now. If you go back and look at a couple of the other crises that the, the, at least the Silicon Valley and the uh, entrepreneurial community has gone through, and you will realize how much of the leadership position was gained during those crises. So culturally, there's definitely, you know, the pie shrinking, how do we get a bigger share of that? Um, you know, aside for the, uh, the, the the obvious, you know, safety aspect of it, the cost reduction aspect of it, for the leadership uh, for those companies that can really accelerate their growth in a time like COVID, 
um, you know, the people like you mentioned several times in your presentation, those are focused on digitalization, right? Um, whether it's two years or 10 years, the acceleration was very obvious. All the, 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 the fear of adopting new technology has gone away by you know, replaced by necessity of adopting new technology. So those are working on those digital transformational technology mm -hmm. really saw this as a way to advance their projection of market adoption. Uh, aside from, so the growth is really the significant uh, investment thesis. Where can you grow? Of course, everybody else is trying to reduce operational costs, you know, reduce, you know, uh, capital investment. Building are not being painted or renew and new furniture are not coming. So that kind of investment was not taking place. But the, the, the growth dominated the growth in the marketplace or market share particularly has dominated the digital you know technology companies during the time of Kobe. Yeah, interesting. I think we've seen such accelerated decision making as kind of a necessity, like you said, as we we have to empower our workforce to maintain operations. And, and how do we do that? Well, we may need video conferencing software, we may need uh, some software as a service. We've seen that internally, we've, we've begun using tools and platforms that uh, Orange Silicon Valley hadn't been planning to use before the pandemic. Uh, so, so do you see a, a change in enterprise software as a service? And do you think that there's a stickiness to this current moment we're in? Or do you think it's kind of temporal and uh, or temporary that, that that we'll go back to the way things were. How, how permanent do you think this work from home uh, transformation is? I I definitely. I mean, your 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 staff were very good, very illustrative of the trends that I see. Most of the CEO will tell you they were very surprised by the level of productivity that they were able to either retain or, in some cases, even grow. I mean, some of us like to complain that we're working more, right? <laughs> <laughs> than we were when we weren't at home. It's like there is really no, you know, uh, uh, division between when we're available when we're not anymore. Um, so I definitely think just the necessity of working from home has forced people to learn so quickly. Um, you know, this whole, uh, you know, doing everything remotely, that was something that things that we were not able to even imagine a few months ago um, to do a remotely are all being done today. Uh, I know personally, there's a lot of things that I will never go back to the past and, you know, shopping at Costco being one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Although I know I can get everything delivered to my door. I'm never going back to that parking lot. Uh, <laughs> so, so you know, it, it is it is really really very surprising the level of productivity, and I think all of us were learning about that. Um, people are really you know comfortable in doing a lot of business over you know the uh, the zone, even investment, even meeting teams and having. I will say in some cases, I actually feel people are starting to connect in a more holistic way. I mean, knowing your dog and knowing your kids and whatever decor you like in your house versus other, I mean, there's really adding dimensions, I think, to a lot of very pure business relationships that we had. Um, I was actually just on Zoom with the uh, founder and CEO of Zoom, um, Eric, and we're actually giving him a hard time about uh -huh. um, you know the fact that we're all doing our business breakfast, lunch, and dinner over Zoom these days. That they're actually a smell transfer technologies that he can add as a tool to Zoom. So there's some more physical attributes that are added to our uh, conversation. I think there's a lot of these type of thinking that you know want to enhance what we're doing today remotely rather than just can't wait to get out of this. I mean, there's a balance to everything, but I think the normal um, 
normal aspect of work is going to change more flexibility absolutely like i said some somewhat driven by the human aspect the humanity aspects that we started this conversation in many way is driving the company and the ceo to start to look at a deeper level of the employee and the customer as a human being their safety their comfort uh, as part of the decision making and that i think is a very positive trend excellent yeah you know if you had told me that board meetings would be conducted in vr about <laughs> nine months ago i would have thought uh, <laughs> no way that's not going to happen and of course mark zuckerberg is talking about the benefits of their vr boardroom meetings so uh, rolling back the dial to your uh, career at IBM, I, I think you had to go undergo such dramatic transformation, starting as an engineer and as a, as, a, as a female engineer and working your way up through the ranks. How do you think adaptability is helping leaders embrace this moment, uh, this trying moment uh, where they're managing the fear and uncertainty of their customers and their shareholders? What's the role of kind of ability to adapt you know, I think it's the secret sauce of Silicon Valley. For those of you who are not in this valley, um, my um, my um, uh, deep belief in what distinguishes this place versus the rest of the world. And you know, I, I you know, you and I were in Ireland. I, you know, my operation was all over the world. I get asked that question a lot, and um, I'm very convinced the ability that to adapt and then continue to iterate really has a lot to do with the level of failure tolerance that the entrepreneur in silicon valley are allowed and in some way even celebrated so i think it's too too easy to say um you know let's let's just get more information about you know mm -hmm whatever decision we're making, particularly in large enterprises, is sort of a, let's study these things to death, is uh, what we used to joke around, uh, because there's always more information you can bring in into just about any decision-making process. But when are you going to strike and start to really mm -hmm. have something in the marketplace and start to really have real-time you know, executions that you can gather real time information that matters and be able to quickly iterate on top of mm -hmm. what that is. And, and to be honest, the product market, you know, fit is never the same from the time the company is seeded or invested by venture to when they become successful and serving customers and having a market um, with paying customer. So large company need to learn about that risk prom attitude of accepting potential failure but the failure in which you can very quickly iterate upon and come out with a better solution and i see in many way and as you know i came from the r d side i mean i defended r d with my life because I, these are my colleagues and these are people that i grew up with but fundamentally really is the, the fast iterations that differentiated the traditional R&D and the venture entrepreneurial decision. Um, and, and that really allow a lot of corporation to be able to bring these young company and very quickly serve the markets that they want to serve because internally they just could not keep up with that fast iteration to get to the market as fast as the startup can. Um, so I will say coming off this, we should all keep that in mind that there is no perfect data yes. for the decision. And we should all be willing to accept changes and be willing to move forward mm -hmm. with the changes. And, and of course, staying agile so we can adapt as new information comes in. Yeah, I, I think I've seen that myself in entrepreneurs. In the, within the first few weeks of the pandemic, I was already receiving pitches to, to, to work on new products and new technology to yeah. mitigate the spread of COVID-19 or otherwise protect people. Yeah. Right. Entrepreneurs uh, look for opportunity in, in the midst of chaos and, and, to, and to serve the customer. 
Right. Uh, so, so putting your corporate manager hat back on, uh, do you think this will change the lens on working with innovators? I mean, I think anybody who works at the nexus of innovation and corporate governance, it, it, sometimes it can be challenging to convince corporate leadership to work, to take a bet on a young company or a new product or a new service that doesn't have as a large installed base. Uh, so do you think it'll, it'll change discussions at the board, at the, at the highest levels of organizations around uh, m a activity or investment activity i think i think it will improve but you know keep in mind that the uh the costs you know sort of operational costs con will continue to be a focus for the short term so i certainly will not expect the uh the investment to ramp up very quickly um but on the other hand the venture investment you know as you know the fundraising has been historical uh i'm sure you all read the 3.6 billion uh funds that we just closed at nea so there is i think a lot of capitals are being invested right now and the corporate investment is going to take a longer pause just because there is a, you know, sort of the core that needs to be uh, stabilized first. But, in the, but I don't think it's slowing down the innovation. I think it's real, the innovation will continue, but the corporation coming in and leveraging that innovation is where the impact is going to be for the short term. Well, with that, that's awesome. Thank you so much. With that in mind, I'd like to ask uh, Will Barkas, my colleague, to join us, who's been fielding questions from the audience. Uh, Will, when you have a minute, just uh, dial on to the, the WebEx. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for the great uh, session, both of you. This was really, really, really interesting. Um, and thanks for everyone for all the, the chat and the questions. So um, first question, do you think that the next normal is going to impact all sectors the same way, or are there going to be certain sectors, you know, more affected? Um, and relatedly, how does this impact sort of more analog, you know, more more physical types of work? You know, I I, I definitely don't think it's going to affect the same way across the board. I think the 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 physical model will continue, but the physical model will be enhanced by the technology more rapidly than what we have projected. Prior to this, um, you know, going back into you know Costco, as I just mentioned in my example, um, you know, I think deployment of analytics that can help us uh, with better social distancing, with you know more safety. Uh, I seen startup doing fantastic work on that. You know, it's sort of a, um, you know, in what way they can give you real time information about your safety when you're in a physical space or you know any kind of a, a, a physical model business would need to start to deploy that. Uh, I think uh, airlines, hotels, all these that are going to be greatly affected by the corona uh, will need to, you know, they can change to digital business, of course, they, they are by, by default um, physical, uh, will need to deploy these type of new technology to enhance their model. Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that, that makes a lot, a lot of sense. Um, and digital transformation is so kind of relative to the company and the industry, right? But a question about uh, how are startups gonna be affected by the new normal in the US and in the Valley in particular, will it be more difficult to raise funds? You know, I think, you know, any crisis accelerate, in my opinion, what was, you know, imminent anyway, <laughs> I think what you will see, um, you know, there will still be a lot of money chasing the top tier startup companies. Um, those are, you know, venture funds and, and even corporate funds will continue to focus on more so than ever um the uh the, the companies that has a clear roadmap or has already some kind of you know uh proof points uh that will, will 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 validate their business model and unfortunately in time like this and as we saw um those are not necessarily in that top quattro need to really you know bring down their 
you know, uh, a runway and potentially seek other sources of continued development, you know, strategic. I mean, Jim, I mean, you guys know this a lot because Orange is very active. Uh, are there a strategic that can be uh, a partner for us to continue to deploy our technology or continue to develop the technology? Are there pilots that we should be establishing? Um, you know, there is uh, a lot more creativity that can be injected uh, when the capital are not necessarily the only path to success for startup. And I think the smart one needs to look at a broader spectrum of potential funding sources that can allow them to weather, you know, the potential slowdown on their development capital. Yeah, and actually, so so complimentary question to that. Um, you know, with with here's the question with revised investments and emphasis on core business. You know, focus during during the current crisis and slow down the economy. Where do you see bigger companies, I guess, innovating in digital, and how can these companies like Orange, you know, leverage opportunities both short and medium term for the in the new normal? You know, it is a really a dilemma, in my opinion, because at the at the one sense. If you're a large company and you are comfortable to grow through M&A um, and through acquisition, through partnership, this is actually a great time, right? Because you have the ability to integrate components of technology and build solutions that are literally uh, bleeding edge components and therefore, you know, uh, being state of the art solution, more so than a single startup with a scale is able to do. So that is my way to say for a large corporation, this is a great time to come in and say, what is my strategy to this adjacent market? And in what way can I use my, you know, scale, my distribution, my channels, whatever, large company possess to really throw up what 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 I call a string of pearl approach, right? How can I plug in all these different, you know, pearl and then build this holistic solution and hit the market at the right time? But and then on the other hand is, you know, how do I preserve my capital as everybody um, is trying to do right now, calling all my line of credit, you know, throughout this whole sustainability component of it. Uh, let's not spend any money, you know, doing anything that are outside the core. So my advice is, you know, I mean, all the company, most company, large company are fairly well capitalized, not to mention the Fed is sitting there and saying, I'm not going to let anybody big fail. Um, really is a great opportunity to activate this hunting and gathering, I call it, to see what is out there and at what price can I snap that? And of course, don't go after the Zoom of the world, right? That is that is just like that is already you know way way above and beyond anybody's grasp. But there's so many innovative company right now that are willing to potentially join a larger company in in order to continue to develop their technology. Okay, I got, uh, here's a, a, a string of questions I'm gonna try and weave together for you. And maybe, I know we're about five minutes over, um, so we, we can kind of wrap whenever whenever you, you feel like it. But um, so along those lines, how are companies considering kind of new emerging technologies, for instance, like IoT deployments, and that's not so new and emerging, but, it, it, <laughs> or, you know, another question about like augmented reality or, or mixed reality uh, type solutions, or, or even rethinking things like real estate. Like how are companies going to, how should they be considering the real estate assets now? And You know, I mean, I, you know, I'm a, a director at the CoreLogic, which is the largest real estate data <laughs> company, um, you know, from, from a, uh, 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 you know, real estate perspective, I think the residential real estate is actually getting, is going to get a boost 
um, you know, people are much more conscientious about where they live. <laughs> and if you saw, you know, Jameson's chart earlier of all the CEOs saying, hey, you know, I want you to work remotely, you know, people reevaluate. Um, you know, most of us at the certain stage of our life probably spend more time in our workspace than we do at our residential space. And certainly the two merges. So it become more like, okay, um, uh, is this where I want to be? And there is a migration. I can go in there for hours. You can see I, I absorb the real estate trends as, as a board member. But I, I think, you know, real estate is something that, you know, the business real estate is going to go through significant, you know, uh, ch changes. I think the demand for just putting a lot of capital into business, you know, real estate, like I said, your furniture and your paint job are all being put on hold right now. And people are really focusing much more on the digital experience, rather is with their employees or with their customers. Wow. Kari, I could listen to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I, th I think we'll, uh, we'll come to a close. I, I think coming back to, to, to round out the discussion, really the, the focus on the human first, and it all cascades from that, whether yeah. it's the customer or the employee. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. It's meant a lot to me. I, you, you have an unparalleled perspective stemming this long career from innovation and corporate governance. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll go to the end questions, Kathy, if you want to go back to the, so, um, please tune in everyone for the next, uh, normal sessions this summer. We'll have uh, another 11 webinars focused on different spheres of influence. Um, and with that in mind, uh, thank you and goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>